Welcome. This is the 22nd of March, 2022, and we're having a Google Summer of Code brainstorming session on the Git cache maintenance project idea. And we should really call it that to make sure it's correct. So the idea is that the Jenkins Git plugin has many caches that it maintains as on the controller. And those caches by their nature sometimes become suboptimal because Git operations are not focused on maintaining long-term optimization. They're forced, focused on short-term performance. And so this idea is, hey, let's, let's find ways to automate the process of maintaining those caches and keeping them healthy. So, so the idea was, I was thinking and scribbling about something with, now you'll notice my lovely, this is such a beautiful user interface picture. I know you all wish you did user interface pictures like this. The, the idea is on the Manage Jenkins page. So let's bring up a real Jenkins and look at it so that we can see how real, okay. So on the Manage Jenkins page here, Today, there are these, these things like the label implications and like configuration slicing and like configuration as code. Each of them is its own sub page, if you will. And I was thinking, okay, this Git cache maintenance maybe belongs in some sort of a sub page of Manage Jenkins like this. So that was the first now to the rest of you, does that make sense to you? Or is there something you would recommend instead? No, it'd be better if we did it this other way. Um, so uh, Mark, one of the questions, yeah, I, I think definitely we should have a separate page because I was going through Git maintenance um, uh, documentation yesterday and I saw that there is a lot of behavior that, that is customizable, right? And we would want um, the user to be able to have that um, in a separate page instead of doing it in the, let's say, configure system or the global team configuration. Uh, but, right. my, but my biggest concern with having, um, which I saw in the document as well uh, in your ideas was that uh, having a page would, um, uh, would be a global settings, right? Would, would be the, like a system wide configuration where all of the repositories would have the same um, uh, configuration for maintenance. That, that was at least my assumption. So I think what you're highlighting is there may be cases where I need to do specific repository configuration. For example, I know the Linux kernel needs some different cache maintenance operations configured than every other repository in my system because that Linux kernel repository is enormous. Is that sort of what you're alluding to, Rishab? Uh, but two two concerns there. One is that um, how is my Git executable chosen uh, when I'm running this command? I mean, I was looking at Git maintenance start, and when you do that, where on whatever repository you're doing that, uh, it's going to choose the Git executable on the basis of that um, repository. And um, in let's say in a system where we have multiple uh, executables, then how how is that? going to happen considering the fact that different git versions are going to limit or you know give us the ability to perform various tasks uh, usually uh, you know involved in plumbing good good point okay so so let me let me for those whom rishab is showing his incredible value at having done that project 2 years ago so if jgit is selected let me let me highlight this one. So if JGit is selected, then the controller process address space or controller memory pro, memory footprint will increase while JGit is performing the operation inside the controller JVM as one example, right? Whereas if command line git is selected, then a separate process is run and the memory footprint 
shrinks or, or the memory footprint is not inside the uh, controller's JVM. Okay, so, and now, now to back to your question, how is the Git executable chosen? I think that, wouldn't you think that would need to be some sort of a global setting? Say, I want to use Git, or I want to use CLI Git, or I want to use JGit. Tell me more of your thinking, Rishab. Yeah, I, I, I agree. When we're talking about a global configuration, we need to make sure that uh, we are consistent with what we choose in the, I believe the global tools configuration page, uh, when we're trying to choose the Git version and the type of Git uh, implementation that we want to use. Yeah, okay. So, so, and when I think about global tool configuration, what it presents to me is possible Git implementations, but it doesn't really choose one, right? Mm, it, okay. it presents, mm. I've got one I named Git Windows. I've got another one I named Git-2.11.1. And, and those are, any one of them I can choose, but none of them is selected, if I recall, is maybe I'm wrong, is default selected as the default? I don't remember. Good question. All right, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a valid thing to say I think if it were a setting on the page, then we would expect all tasks on the page to use that image or to use that, that version, that Git tool. Yeah, correct, yeah. Okay. All right, so before we go further with that, any questions from others around that topic of of how is the Git executable chosen? I was wondering that, uh, is, it, is it possible if we can have uh, have something that, that uses both the JGit and the CLR? Oh, oh, that's a good question. Okay, so let's put that. Uh, are there cases where it would be useful or helpful to use both JGit and CLI Git. And, and, and that might, let me, let me give a hypothetical. The hypothetical would be something like what Rishab's project did two years ago, which was uh, what if JGit is significantly faster faster at some operation. Um, uh, what if CLI Git is significantly faster? So Rishab found by benchmarking that with large repositories, CLI Git is significantly faster for fetch operations. Rishab, did I say, say that correctly? Yes, yes. So it's a good question. Should we should we consider the potential that we might need to do some performance-based selection? Ooh, this repository we know is this size and we've got in our toolbox, J both JGit and CLI get version such and such. And we've had run benchmarks previously that tell us with that repository size or this some, some characteristic, we should choose this implementation. I, I think it's a, a valid thing. Now for me, Performance optimization is usually a late stage thing after the implementation is working and, and delivered. So for instance, we didn't do Rishab's project until the Git plugin had existed for over 10 years, I think. 2007 to 2000. Yeah, it was an over 10 year old plugin before we actually applied Rishab's optimization. So, so I'm not terribly worried about this optimization, but I think it's a valid question to ask. Did, did that address your question? Yes. yes. And sorry, I wasn't sure who that was. That Was that Hushikesh or was that Aryan? Uh, me, Aryan. Uh, Aryan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, all right, so. All 
All right. Okay. So, well, so we've, we've talked about choosing the Git executable and possibly choosing to mix implementations. Any other questions that you want to raise around those sort of topics? Um, yeah, Mark, the second concern that I, uh, that I have with global configurations is that uh, uh, the tasks that are going to be performed with gate maintenance, some of those tasks are, direct, are correlated to the size of a repository. So there is a possibility that I don't want to run GC, let's say for a huge repository with the said interval that I've set in the global configurations, because I know that that repository will take a lot of time. GC operation will take a lot of time. So do we want to, uh, do we want to give an overridable way somewhere? Uh, I, I think that would be uh, possible, right? I mean, having a global configuration and then a way to override that configuration per repository. I think that's, and I think that's a very good question. How, how, what, what mechanisms can we give the user to, to provide finer grained control of the maintenance tasks, right? Because I think, I think you, you raise an excellent point garbage collection on the Linux kernel repository takes a very long time, is very CPU intensive and very memory intensive. Mm -hmm. It will, with command line Git, use every core on your system. And if I remember correctly, it's willing to use almost as much memory as you give it. The, the, the Linux mm -hmm. kernel people are not at all shy about using memory. They think memory is something that should be used. <laughs> So, so it's a, it's a very good question. What, what might we consider? So one might be um, override rules, maybe where we say, um, or override settings based on, based on repository size. Um, what else? I mean, we could, we could, Call a call a, a, a shell script, a user provided shell script to decide if this thing should be run or not. We could allow call a user provided Groovy script. Since this is system level stuff, it could be doing system level groovy. There's a little bit of danger hiding there, but we could. Uh, any other ideas on mechanisms to provide fine grained control of the tasks? We could, how about this? We could just say repository, a, a repository based exclusion list. So here's, if the repository you are if the repository URL is git colon slash slash kernel.org. I'm making things up now, sorry, slash Linux. Don't GC. Or maybe GC only GC monthly. Something like that. Other ideas? Uh, so do we absolutely restrict the uh, user from GCing even uh, like uh, once a week or twice a week? Or do we just like strongly warn them that it, it could be, it could be eating a lot of memory? So, so for me, I would, I would generally, it's a good question. Um, I've preferred in the past anyway, to allow the user to choose to do it and where necessary, offer them a warning or even better offer them hints if things are going badly that would tell them why things are going badly. So should we, we prevent users from doing certain tasks? And, and, and my thought was, 
no but but i'm open to, to difference there right the get maintenance man page definitely says um hey we we intentionally do not run gc as part of maintenance but we allow you to decide that you will run gc that may lead us to this next question of which tasks should we enable by default and how would we decide I, um, that is a um, so I was reading about commit graphs as a task, and I, I got to know that there is a uh, there's a setting which is not enabled by default, which is called a uh, write commit graph, fetch dot write commit graph. So what it does is if it, uh, so how commit graphs would work right now is that your GC whenever the, your GC runs, it's going to update your commit graph, and after that, whenever there's going to be a fetch in your repository, so the commit graphs. Um, uh, the amount of time that it's going to take uh, for it to update the commit graph depends on the, uh, the number of commits that, that are going to happen to your repository. So if you have an active repository and between the interval of updating the GC and then you performing a git fetch, you actually could potentially slow down the uh, operation time uh, of a git fetch. If you don't have this um, command, in a, if this setting enabled, which is write commit graph, and I believe this is not enabled by default, according to the pay, uh, the man page for the commit graph. So right. I mean, we need to look at the individual um, tasks that we we enabling by default, and then see how they're going to uh, you know affect the existing user behavior, or if they're going to ex uh, affect the existing behavior or not. Well, and and now to take that theme. How could we how could we make the information about that task available to the user? What if we gave them a, an entry on the UI, something like this? Let's see, update commit graph down here, and one of the one of the data points we show them is the trend graph that shows how long that ran on their repositories. And, and hopefully they look at the graph and say, oh, wow, here's this repository where the, no, no, that, that's maybe not good enough, is it? Because your point, Rishab, was that if I don't update the commit draft, I may get slower performance from git fetch. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I, no, if I don't enable this setting, and mm -hmm. if I have a large active repository, then there is a potential of slowing the git fetch operation itself. Yeah. That is what the man page says. Uh, so, uh, can, so can, I, the, yeah. uh, can the git prefetch command help in this case? Because prefetch would, you know, uh, do the fetch operation beforehand. Well, I thought that I thought that Rishab's concern that the the way that it was describing the commit graph. Let's uh, get commit graph. I thought it was that it when the fetch is performed then it does the update of the commit graph is that did i understand that correct correctly rishab yes so if you search for write commit graph fetch dot write commit graph if you search for that there's a setting which is not um fetch hmm. no I, I, it would be right um uh, camel case uh yeah but Okay, so write a commit graph. Okay, here's commit graph, write. Interesting. Okay, so maybe I'm on the wrong page, Rishab. So here's this core.commit graph. Is that, is that what you were referencing? Uh, no, this is, this is what I think enables um, commit graph as a setting, global setting. Okay. Okay, so what we're looking for then is use of the word right. Uh, let me have I sent you a link. Can you open this? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, oh, it's described in git config, not in okay. Oh, very good. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, so it says set to true to write a commit graph after every fetch that downloads a pack file. If the split option is used, it will write a small one and occasionally they will merge and writes may take longer. Interesting. So there is, I believe, I'm not 100% uh, sure, but there is a way they chain the commit graphs so that, you know, they take the deltas and not take the whole, they don't update the whole uh, commit graph on the basis of, uh, you know, every fetch that they're doing. If you have this setting enabled, but if you don't, then they're going to write it every time. Which is a costly operation, right? Well, and I, see, I don't know how costly it is, but I think I think it's worth us worth us dis, doing exploration. They chose to disable it by default, so it's certainly a cost that I'm not paying at all right now, right? I'm when I do a fetch, I none of the the Git repositories that I handle are doing this, and yet it says it would. I do git log minus minus graph all the time. And so this says, wow, I probably should turn on fetch write commit graph so that my log minus minus graph calls are faster. Hmm. I mean, I, my, my point was just that we need to look at each of the tasks and the settings that they're providing and then think uh, what strategy could we implement which ones to enable by default, which ones to not. Right, right, very good. Okay, the idea being, hey, should we, should, should commit graph be enabled by default? Now let's, let's get maintenance. Okay, so get maintenance, this one. So commit graph is enabled by default. Right, and it's scheduled to run hourly. Hmm. If you register the, the the maintenance, it will run every hour. I think this might be due to uh, something that was implemented in one of the later versions of Git. Uh, I I read this one article where it mentioned that in version two point two four of Git, it introduced a new thing in the commit graph. And it was called a generation number. And what it did was like it significantly reduced the number of commits uh, that it needed to uh, read through. And uh, I think it, it, it used like some uh, Khan's algorithm and computed the number of in degrees while it was traversing the, uh, the, the graph. But, but like after, after the generation count, uh, after the generation count was implemented, it didn't need to, and it got a lot more efficient. So before that version, I think it was, uh, the, the comment graph was very inefficient. So if we were to implement it for something like CentOS, so I think for those cases, it might be inefficient. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a good insight that there may, okay, so what you're saying is there may be versions of command line Git where these settings should be quite different. Yes. Ah, okay. I, I, that's very wise because, well, and and to your point, commit graph may not even be available on some of the command line Git versions that we run, and and may not help if it were available, right? Because if I'm using doing a command line Git operation and the command line Git implementation doesn't know anything about commit graph, it certainly can't use it. Interesting. Good. And okay. Very good. Yeah, and earlier it used to do a commit graph update while it was doing the GC um, task. So uh, their, their rationale there was that G, compared to the GC task, that right, commit graph won't take uh, you know, much of the operational time. So they, they club it together. And, and that, that is what they used to do. Okay, and, and that, that makes sense to me at least. It's like, yeah, Garbage collection is very expensive, right? It's doing, mm, yes. it's doing recombining, and then it does this large compression operation, and and compressing files is is almost always very expensive. So so, yeah, that makes sense. You could easily hide a small operation like commit graph inside all the time you're spending doing garbage collection. Good. Okay. Mm. 
All right. Well, so then, oh, go ahead. No, Mark, I just, uh, yeah, so we probably need to yeah, see that. I mean, we just need to decide what kind of strategy we're going to implement on the basis of. Uh, yeah, so, so, well, so for me, it would it be okay if on the task selection, I'm going to propose an idea and let's, let's test it as an idea. And then we certainly can throw it out. My initial thought was test the, the task selection priority. Here's my proposal. Okay. So I think prefetch has the most, uh, let's put it in my words, Mark thinks prefetch has the most opportunity to improve things. Because it is, it avoids, how would you say it? It loads, oh, it does network traffic, which is very, very slow compared to disk traffic, network traffic um, reduction, right? So one of the best things we can do is do less network traffic this thing, when I'm doing a fetch in a from a repository that has already done a prefetch, it avoids a whole bunch of network traffic because it's already been done. It's already been pulled in. So for me, I think this one is should be priority one, first choice. Make sure that works and we get good results. Now, if we're doing prefetch, then the next question is, okay, now we're potentially every hour bringing in or every some time bringing in things that are come in as loose objects. They come in without necessarily being well, well placed inside the repository. So should we then consider other things as second as later priority? And now this is where I don't know which of the next ones should be should be preferred. Any any insights to offer anyone there? I, I feel the incremental repack should be placed uh, after the prefetch. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us more. Uh, uh, the incremental uh, repack basically, uh, I, I feel it works like a, you know, a B tree, okay, where uh, all the objects are uh, placed in a sorted manner, okay, in in the re, uh, in the MDX file, okay, and each uh, uh, object is referred to a separate pack file. So it would be easier to search through the commits uh, if you if we have a incremental uh, repack as a second option is what I feel. Good. Okay, and that I think that's a that's a testable idea and and. That feels reasonable to me. So, before that, uh, I, I just have one question. Uh, now, prefetch, what is it exactly? Is it just getting the references, the updated references into a separate directory, or is it actually downloading the objects that are not yet present in the um, local repository? My understanding is it's getting the objects. Oh, okay, okay. So, so my interpretation of the way this is described is it's doing the equivalent of a git fetch minus minus all, but placing the refs in a different location so that the repository doesn't, doesn't so that the repository state of the, mo of the for instance, the, the master branch pointer is actually not updated. So it says, this is done to avoid disrupting the remote tracking branches. My interpretation of that is prefetch does the fetch and hides the result of the fetch locally in a way that Git can find them, but does not update the remote tracking branches. Okay. 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 And, and for me, this was a, oh, that's smart because I would have just done a fetch. But the problem with doing a fetch is somebody else maybe depending on that cache staying in its having its remote tracking branches stay in their current state you know they, they the 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 thing that's maintaining that's 
that owns the cache thinks it has control over when when remote tracking branches are updated. Did, did that answer your question, Rishab? Yes, it did. I, I mean, so the subsequent question is that if objects are going to be downloaded and they are loose, they're not uh, they're not in a pack file, right? So then would, would we not want to run something which are going to put them in a pack file? Well, and I think that git fetch, fetch will on later versions of Git actually place objects into additional pack files. Okay. So, so there's, if I remember right, there's this thing called a multi-pack index that will allow, that allows Git to use multiple pack files. But if I understand correctly, that's a recent, a relatively recent, like within the last two or three years, feature of Git. It, it, does anyone else have experience with multi-pack index that, that they can enlighten the rest of us? Let's see if I can find it, multi-pack. Oh, here we go, look, okay. Okay, so incremental repack, it uses multi-pack index to repack the objects. First by calling expire to delete unreferenced pack files, and then by calling repack to combine several pack files into a single bigger one. Yeah, so, so this feels like for me, Okay, back to our question. It was, should we put, I think this is lobbying that Rushikesh had it right, that incremental repack is a really good choice as, as very, very close to prefetch in terms of its values. Mark, I'll share you a link. Okay, one minute. Can you open it? One minute. Sure. So are you sharing it through the Gitter chat or through, oh good, you did uh, it. Okay, here we go. I, I Got sent it, it in the... Perfect, here it is. Okay, so 2.20 introduced a single file that consolidates all of the index files. Uh, this actually gave me an overview, like uh, actually it gave me an overview of exactly how this incremental repack works using uh, uh, the multi-pack index. So the, both the commands, that is the expire and uh, the repack command uh, has been explained in this. Uh, okay, so, so this, yeah. this article, so let's be sure we include a link to this. Okay, see the Stack Overflow article. For incremental repack details. Very good, excellent, okay. Sorry, I had to cough, excuse the muting. Okay, very good. So. So what this is telling us is it's not especially healthy to have many pack files. And what this has done is if we do, yeah, okay, here we go. This is talking about, let's talk about the Linux kernel. Multi-pack files can cost, cost time, but we may not be able to repack into a single pack, pack file because it just takes too long right, or consumes too much space. And so what this is offering us is the multi-pack index, and we get that by doing the incremental repack. Is that correct, Rushikesh? Yeah. Yes, Mark. Okay. Good, all right. 
Okay, so which, which feels like that gives us a strong reason to say yes, prefetch and yes to incremental repack. Those should, should both be on just as they are in the, and now I assume we've got a challenge there of, maybe I should make a note here, um, need to assess the operations based on, and their results based on the different versions of command line Git. Right, because um, multi-index, multi-pack index looks like it requires at least Git 2.20. Go ahead, Rushi. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Mark. I, one question that I have is that um, there is also a loose objects the maintenance uh, task, right? So uh, I, I guess this is more of a confusion for me. If we're doing a prefetch, then we, are we introducing more loose objects into the uh, the local directory, or we are introducing more pack files that need I've, to be repackaged. And I thought that with current versions of Git, it does a. Uh, we could easily we could test it really quickly. If you're okay, if I run a test, let's just go do a quick look to see. So I happen to have a a repository that is rather large. And let's go look at it just to see. So um, how about in, let's see. Yeah, there we go. The, this directory has a copy of it. And let's see what a mess it is. Okay, so here is something, and now what's in its pack direct? Yeah, okay, here's a, here's a terrifying example of this is a 100 or 150 megabyte repository. I use it to test all sorts of awful things. And so, but what you see here is an embarrassing number of pack files. Right, there really should be in an ideal world two, an IDX and a pack, and that's it. And this has many, many more than that, and it's got all sorts of loose objects. Now, if I do a git pull, let's see, how about let's count the number of those there are. So we have 62 files in that direct directory right now. Let's see if it has to bring anything. Okay, so it's bringing in some new content. It added four more files. So I think that indicates it did add new packs, not just new loose objects. Did, did that address your question, yes. Rishab? Yes, Mark, I did. Now, we and we should be able to see that by doing this, we should see that yeah, notice here is here is something which changed February 12, and then there are four more things March 22. And yeah, so here's a good indicator. Notice the size of this monster. This file is 77 megabytes. Yes, yes, it's embarrassing. Nobody should put 70 megabytes in a Git repository. That's sick and wrong. But but that's what this one has done. It's got one of the, this pack file is enormous. And there are other pack files that are pretty hot, pretty large. This one looks like it's 25 meg, you know, so, so it's a big, this is a big repository. And I, I, I suspect if I run git GC, it will run for 15 minutes or more. So, so did that address the Yes, we're confident we want prefetch. We want incremental repack. Your question, Rishab, I think was, do we also want to make loose objects a standard, a standard part of it, like 
like Git maintenance does, right? Because Git maintenance has chosen to do loose objects daily, less frequently than prefetch, but, but it much more frequently than GC. Yes, and if we do, if we're choosing to perform loose objects, then we would do it before the incremental read back, right? Because we want to have more pack files first and then repackage them, whatever repackage to do. Good, good point. Yeah, let's, so let's see, it says it place cleans up loose objects and places them into pack files. Yeah, so well, so okay, so I'm going to try something here in that that repository. So it's got some stuff in objects, get loose objects. Oh, I, no. I, I don't think that's the comment. Yeah. How about maintenance? minus minus task equals hmm oh come on there's got to be a way to do it so there it is loose objects loose objects job minus would minus be get maintenance run that's, that's oh, task. oh, thank you. Right, of course. Clearly, I don't have enough experience with this, do I? Like that. Okay, get maintenance run. Maybe it's task. Oh, yep. Okay, oh, yeah. that was it. And now what did it do to our... They're still there except did we get a new entry in the, let's see, ls minus altr uh, dot git slash object slash pack. We had 66 before. And now we have, oh, and look, there it is. Loose dot lose pack. It. Okay, so, so it, and, and back to their comment, they said, hey, we're going to do loose objects and it's going to create the new pack file, but it did not apparently delete all the other things. It left them around. So there's a pack file for use, but the loose is still, seems to still be there. Interesting. Okay, cool. Now I have no idea. I assume Git must be able to use the loose thing. Okay, good. So Rishab, back to your question. Are we answering the question that you had about how do we approach it? Yes, I think we would, we would run, we would want to run loose objects first, right? Like prefetch loose objects and then incremental feedback. So, that, so we're able to ah, use right. I see what your point is. Okay, and but now let's let's test that. So they say they run incremental repack and loose objects daily, but they run prefetch hourly by default. So should we be considering their 24 times more frequently running prefetch than they are running incremental repack and honor the same idea? Uh, I have a doubt here. Would uh, uh, this incremental repack would would it even consider loose objects as part of it? I thought it that it did not. Files, right? right? Didn't it say that it only does multi-pack indexes? Mm -hmm. Okay, it deletes so it... unreferenced pack files and then combines pack files. So I would think incremental repack does not do loose objects. That would lobby for Rishab's argument that we should do loose objects and incremental repack as sort of two steps close to each other, one right after the other. Is that what you were asking? Uh, uh, no, what was it uh, like my question is like, would increment uh, the multi pack index file, would it consider uh, the loose objects pack file which has been generated in the terminal? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I that's a good question. I don't know. Let's, well, let's, let's try it and see. We've got a task here. So this time we're going, we just did loose objects. So now let's do incremental repack. Hmm. 
Now it added three more files. This multi-pack index and two more pack uh, and a, another pack. Now, I don't remember seeing a multi-pack index in the list at all. Let's see, and the count of files, it was, we went up by three. So we, we got a pack. So multi-pack index did not exist before I did get maintenance run incremental repack. So I've been running with a suboptimal setup because I wasn't using Git maintenance at all. Oh, this is really great. Thank you. You're all wonderful to be teaching me more about Git. Thank you. Okay, so, so I think what that's saying is man page review indicates we, that loose objects should be run as well. And there it's daily. And this one is also daily. This one is currently hourly, right? In the git maintenance default. Okay. There's also another command uh, directly below the incremental repack called pack refs, and that collects the loose reference files. Ah, okay. All right. Next. So this one. Oh, okay. Now, now then this is, so we saw this one, loose objects created entries in the, in the pack directory loose dash something, what you're thinking is this may actually create them as real packs. Is that is that correct, what you're saying, Ariane? Yes. Okay, so let's try that. Pack dash refs. Okay, that was very fast. And it still seems to have left the, the, the loose objects in there, if, I, if I'm seeing that correctly. There are definitely loose objects in that directory. Okay. So what was pack refs doing? It says collects the loose reference. reference. That, that's only yeah, for branches and uh, tags by default. It's not for all the objects. That's what's specified oh. when you open when you open that link there. Okay, so this it optimization is, the, is not for the objects, right? Right. It's that the word re, the words reference files here are very important, I think is what you're saying, right? Is that this is doing it used to right, right. Okay. It used to store one file per ref in a directory. And if we look, I think I can see that. Yes. Now, if I go, let's go up one. We've already taken it out. Let's try a different. Uh, what's a good bug report? How about. Okay. No. Okay. So I'm not seeing. Oh, oh, if I look in tags, there are a bunch of tags. Now, if I go back to the master directory, I might expect that those were somehow less because it's somehow done a small database of those stored in some other location. 
Is that is that what you're telling me that PacRefs really is creating instead of one file per ref? Um, it's it is, now it is stored in it is stored in a directory called uh, it's stored in PacRef. There should be something called PacRef there. Right. So if I look there, and here is this thing that is some sort of a better representation than a single file per tag or a single file per tag plus single file per branch. Ah, good, okay. All right, so, so for me, PacRefs, now, now my repositories typically don't have an enormous number of, of references. Um, the, that 100 megabyte one that you're, you were seeing is probably has several thousand might be as many as 10,000. Uh, most Git plug, or Jenkins plugin repositories have far fewer than that, right? They have on the order of hundreds maybe. Interesting, okay. So back to the question when, now wait a sec, they don't even list pack refs here as a task. Yes, it's not in the incremental strategy. Oh, okay. Now, so do you think there's a reason for that? Interesting. It's not in the incremental strategy. Okay, so, so does that lobby that we should probably only use pack refs in very special cases? I mean, it is saying that it speeds up operations that iterate across many references. And I don't know how many of those we actually have. Hmm. Okay, so. so. Yeah. so I was just saying that the operations that we would want to optimize would be a get fetch or a get pull. I mean, the operations where there is a significant network bandwidth usage, right? So I believe the priority of the tasks should be um, uh, should be tuned to optimizing those operations. Right, and this one, PacRefs is, PacRefs is not, as far as I can tell, a network, a network related one. It's not going to help network performance. It's not going to reduce network traffic or spread it, spread it out. So for me, um, assumed, not part of our default set. Is that a safe way to say it? Yes, and could we could we do a benchmark on? I mean, we already have the benchmarking framework within the Git client repository, right? So this is a test that maybe could be included in the proposal, but it's an experiment that could be done. It should be interesting, right, to see if. Yeah, the it's challenge for me would be how would, because of what it's doing, how would we, how would we do that benchmark? It's, so it's, okay, so here we go. A repository with too many refs should pack all its refs with minus minus all once and then run pack refs. So I assume, so it'd be get pack refs minus minus all and then every so often run this. I think this would be useful if we have a lot of branches, a lot of, uh, uh, if we have too many branches or uh, get repository has too many branches. But how, how, I mean, if you have a lot of branches, what does it affect? Does it affect the get, oper get fetches operation time? How is it affecting? Because operations? we have to look through a lot of ref, uh, like through, if we go through the uh, ref folder, we'll have a lot of branches, right? So searching through that, I think would take a lot of time. If we do a pack ref, everything we, we put into one place. So uh, the reason why I'm stressing on that is uh, we, so when we did the benchmarks on um, Git operations, what we found out was that the, uh, the, the time it takes for a Git fetch to happen is, is, is a function of the amount, of the size of objects that you have in your repository rather than the number of commits or the number of branches or number of the tags. That is what 
we found at that time okay if you think there is a way for us to demonstrate that the number of branches are going to affect the network intensive git operations then i think we should definitely consider it yeah, yeah. so so and i think i think that's a that's a valid point that pack refs may be a later optimization that we consider or we might what if what if we said hey one of the measures we take of repositories is the number of references and i don't know how we would get that but if we if we computed the number of references and if the number of references was beyond some certain threshold like they say here right a repository with too many refs so if we did some measurement periodically and said this repository has this many refs, some arbitrary number, a hundred thousand. And if it has more than that, we will at least once do a pack, pack refs minus minus all, and then automatically schedule it to do a get pack refs once a week, something like that. I mean, that might be, I, I don't know what that threshold would be. I'm not sure how we would def obtain that threshold and identify it, but it could be a way we handle this, this comment, what the documentation says. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah, Interesting. It needs more, yeah, it needs more investigation. Okay, well, this, this has been a most effective session. Thank you very much to everyone who's been here. I had wanted to limit us to an hour. What I'd propose is if you're, would you like to do this kind of session again? Are you willing to have these kind of discussions? And would it fit for you if we did it um, later this week or early next week? Would that be okay? Are you interested in that? Or is this not nearly interesting to you? You'd rather just focus on other things. What, what's your feedback? I, it's good to have these sessions, Mark, because, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot about what exactly is required and how to proceed also uh, with the implementation. So I, it's better if we have, uh, it's good if we have the, like the, these kinds of sessions. Okay, good. Well, I, so others, I, I like that. that that's, that's great for me. Do others have the same feeling? Yeah, I agree. Uh, this session has been like really helpful in understanding and, uh, and, and, uh, and knowing about how we can proceed forward and how we can look at things. Okay, then what I'd propose is let's plan for an hour a week, if that's okay. And it would be it would actually be a little better for me if we were willing to do it on my on my day when I already am doing office hours. So would you be willing to do it Fridays? rather than doing on, on Wednesday, like we're doing this one, um, so that we would just do it right after Google Summer of Code office hours, or is that not a convenient time for you? So we would basically make GSOC office hours 90 minutes for you instead of 30. I, 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 for me, it's fine, Mark. Now I'm, I'm ready for it. Oh, it's, it's good to you. So Rishab, how about you and Chris, you would, would that, would, would Friday work for you or it's both of them are right in the middle of your working day. And I apologize for that. It's you, India time and Rocky mountain time in the U S are different enough. It's always going to be complicated. Should be okay. Yeah, I, yeah. It should be okay for me as well. Okay. All right. So then let me take, I'll take the action item to schedule schedule recurring sessions uh, immediately after uh, the Asia GSOC office hours. And uh, we'll try to meet weekly, uh, meet to discuss. So that means, let me double check my calendar just a minute to be sure I've got the right. So that means we would next meet on Friday, the 1st of April. Is that okay? Or do we need to meet sooner than that? What time I'm, is that? 
So Friday, April 1, it would be at 3.30 a.m. UTC. Yeah. which is about 30 minutes prior to this time because we are right now no let's see is that right no it is it is exactly at this time so it's right now no no i take it back it's 30 minutes after this time so what time is it locally for you in india right now 8 30 in the morning okay so it's 8 30 a.m now so the meeting then would be would go from nine o'clock a.m. India time to ten o'clock. Does that work okay for you? It works fine for me. Yeah, it's fine, ma. Okay, yes, great. Then then let's plan for that, and if we and then we'll we'll try the same thing the following week and and let's make some progress thanks very much i'll upload the recording of this probably 24 hours from now it's i'm a little behind schedule on recordings right now thanks everybody for your time thank you so much thank you thank you bye